You know, uh, we've been working on this leaf here for about the six or seven, six or seven of the last rain. The positive side of it is, I guess, uh, we uh, at least we've gone from a five-gallon bucket down to a diesel cup. <laughs> but uh, we still haven't gotten it all fixed. But we'll we will get there. We will get there. Uh, let me make uh, just just say one thing. If it's pouring down rain, whenever we dismiss, we do have an awning back here. Now you. <laughs> The downside of it is you've got to trace across the, the backyard, but at least maybe you won't get the rain down your neck whenever you go out the door there. So it's to give you, give you a little option there. It's good to see all of our visitors in the service today. We're glad to have you. Look forward to uh, Mark and Miranda and their clinic. And, you know, I, I don't understand. But, you know, I heard somewhere through the break man, that Carl was putting a tarp over the arena last night. But I see that didn't happen. Well, anyway, let's get into the Word of God before I stick my foot in my mouth any more than I already have. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6. We want to finish that today. Isaiah chapter 6. Last week we covered... Uh, uh, the first uh, six verses, and uh, we plan on finishing today. We have visitors, so I'll just briefly go over a little bit about what what uh, what we talked about last week. Verse one it says, and I'll try to. Hopefully, you can hear me. You know, one thing about not being in Cowboy Church, the metal roof, is we can hear it rain whenever it rains. <laughs> that may aid some of you in going to sleep, but uh, just try not to fall out in the aisle, okay, if you do. First one, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I shared with you last week, that we, we need to have, Isaiah had a vision of God, and we need to have a vision of God. We need to think about Him and think about His grandeur, because here as we read, we see the grandeur of God. Now this is this is not something that I believe was just a, a one-time vision. Because if you go several hundred years over into the last book of the New Testament, Revelation, you will see that John, in his vision of the Lord, had the exact same vision. What is that vision? He said, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. You know, as I said last week, we have a, a habit of getting comfortable in sin. We are comfortable in sin because sin is all around. And sinners are all around. I mean, this morning you probably, like me, you probably, uh, after you shower, if you took one, after you shower, if you took one, where's Josh? Oh, he's Josh. That's my Josh. If you took one, uh, <laughs> you stood in front of the mirror and maybe you combed your hair. That's what I did. I combed my hair and I looked at myself. And you know, whenever I look at myself, as we do so many times, we, we look at ourselves and say, well, you know, that's a pretty good looking guy, or dad. Pretty good looking guy. He's a pretty good fellow. He's a nice guy. And, you know, the Bible says what we do is, you know, I get to thinking, you know, whenever I think of myself, and, and I get looking in the mirror, I, I think, you know what, I'm a pretty good looking guy. And, and you know, I look at least as good as Dennis. <laughs> At least as good as this, and he's about 10 years younger than I am, so I'm doing pretty good, right? What we do is we compare ourselves 
not just our looks, but our actions, we compare with other people. And we get comfortable with that, you know? Because what we're used to is we're used to looking at sinners. You know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, the Bible says. We are all sinners. So whenever we compare ourselves with other people, we can say, well, I'm as good as they are, or I'm better than they are. But the, the fact is, the one that we should be comparing ourselves with is not one that, at least to us, is visible on this earth. We need to, at least I believe, in our mind's eye, catch a vision of God's holiness and righteousness. You know, we compare ourselves with other people. The one we should be comparing ourselves with and our life with so that we can see ourselves as we really are is not other people but God. Because on over in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah makes a statement where he says that all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags compared to the righteousness of God. And as Isaiah had this vision, he no longer was comparing himself to other people that he knew. But he saw himself as a sinner. He saw himself in the condition that that. God saw whenever he looked upon Isaiah. You know, whenever God looks upon us, when he looks upon us, it's not a pretty picture. We like to think, well, you know, God's kind of like your granddad. You know? Have you ever noticed the change between whenever, whenever your daddy was your daddy and when you had children? And he began, became the granddaddy. You know, the things that he used to pull his belt off and just wear your little rear end about are the things that he said, oh, that isn't so bad. Don't do that to him. You never notice that? And so we get that vision of God. That God is like that. But you know, the Bible tells us not only is God a loving God, not only does he love us, the Bible says, with an everlasting love. But God is also a God of righteousness, which this is what Isaiah saw in his vision of God and holiness. And there's no comparison between us and God. Thanks be to God that he took care of it. He took care of it all whenever he said to Jesus, to die on the cross of Calvary. A passage of scripture you may have learned in Sunday school years, years ago. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have the last of life. God took care of it. And all we have to do is by faith believe in God. What did Isaiah do? Whenever whenever he saw himself as he really was. He said, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Unclean lips, <laughs> as I shared with you last week, has always been indicative in the Bible of sin. He wasn't just saying, you know, i got a dirty mouth. He wasn't just saying, well, I've cut some. Or I've cut a lot. What he's saying is, I am a sinner. And you know what? Before we in faith can come to Christ Jesus, we must come face to face with the enormity of our sin. Uh, let me just use a little simple illustration. Let's say, you know, the Bible tells us that sin is the transgression of God's law. Now, we give God's law a negative connotation. God's law is based not upon the fact that God is God and He can do whatever He pleases. He is that. But God's law is based upon what is best for us. 
He created us and He knows what we need to do and what we need to stay away from in order to be successful in life. And so therefore, that's what the law consists of. Those things that say thou shalt not are not there because God is God and He can say, well, you're not going to do this. I don't like it. It's because I, He said, I created you and whenever you do these things, you destroy yourself. So sin is transgression of God's law. Not only that, do you know that sin, the Bible tells us, is neglecting to do things that we know to do. The Bible says, for the man who knows to do right, you know, and does it not, to him it is sin. There are things we know we need to do, not just things we don't need to do, but things we need to do. We know it's right to come to church on Sunday. Isn't that right? The Bible says that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of so, as some is, but so much the more as we see the, the day of His coming approaching. Okay? So sin is not only transgression of the law, but it's also failing to do what we know is right. Not only that, but there's a third thing, and we usually don't think about this. Have you ever thought something like, well, I just, you know, <laughs> let's say somebody really hurts you. I mean, they really hurt you. And you say, I wish we should have dropped dead. Have you ever thought that? I bet you have. I think we all probably all have. <laughs> I just wish they'd drop dead. Well, we know that's wrong, isn't it? We know that's wrong. So sin is not only doing it, but sin, the Bible says, is also even just thinking about it. You remember Jesus made a statement. He said, you know, the law says that you shall not, you shall not transgress the law by having sex with someone that is not your spouse. Adultery or fornication, depending on the situation. But Jesus said, I want to tell you, men, if you see a woman and you look at her and you have adulterous thoughts, you have committed adultery already in your life. Now that just doesn't go for guys, it goes for girls too. And it isn't just for adultery, but you know that, I wish you'd just drop dead. That's sin. So sin is transgression of the law. Sin is also not doing what we know is right. And sin is also even thinking about it. Now, you put those three together, that's really a lot of stuff, isn't it? Now let's say, let's say you're a real good guy or gal. Let's say you only do something you shouldn't do or not do something you should do or think about something you shouldn't be thinking about, let's say, three times a day. If we'll be honest with yourself, that'd be pretty good. Three times a day times 365 and a quarter days in the year, that's over 1,000. You live to be 70, that's over 70,000. Let me ask you, if you got arrested and you were brought before a judge and the prosecutor said, this person has 70,000 transgressions. They broke the law 70,000 times. What would they do to you? I think Texas still has that law, you know, three strikes and you're out, so to speak. You know, three, there are certain things you can do three times when you get life in prison. Now, think about the immensity of our sin. But think also about what it took to have forgiveness of our sin. God's Son died on the cross. So Isaiah is here and he said, I'm a, I'm a sinner and I dwell among a bunch of sinners. And it says, then one of the seraphs flew to me, 
with the last coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Now that, that live coal, that hot coal that was on the altar of God, that is where the sin offering was offered. The cross of Calvary is where our sin offering was offered. And whenever we come to Jesus Christ, it's just like a coal off that altar that Jesus was offered upon, uh, offered upon is taken and all of our sin is gone away. Well, that brings us up to today. <laughs> what happens then? Suddenly Isaiah hears something. He hears a voice say, heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And who will go for us? There's always been that question, what the Lord mean by us? Well, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and they were having a conversation. Who is going to go for us? Now, first thing I'd like for us to think about is this, though. You know what? God has a desire to make us useful. He wants us to do something for Him. Now, keep in mind, God is God, and He doesn't need us, really. He can do anything He wants to, anything He likes. And, and the honest truth is, God does not need us. You remember when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey, on that very first, that very first uh, Palm Sunday, and people were crying out, "Holy, holy, holy!" Kind of like these angels were talking about Jesus. And the chief priest said to Jesus, "Why are they doing this? Why are you allowing them to do this? Why don't you stop them from doing this?" What did Jesus say? He said, "He said, if they don't shout it, the rock." You know what? God can, can make the rocks talk. Now I heard a preacher say one time that Jesus was equating them with, give you ever that expression, dumber than a rock? Sometimes we are. But you see, God does not have to have us. He does not need us. But you know what? He wants to use us each and every one. Isaiah said, whenever God said, who will go for us? Who can we send? Isaiah said, here am I, send me. But you know what? There's something here I think we need to know. Isaiah was not in any frame of mind to be used by God until he had been transformed by God. Think about that. God did not say at the very beginning who will go for us. It was after Isaiah had seen himself as he was and after he had been transformed by God. He had been changed by God. So you see, folks, we need to get ourselves clean first and then God will use us. You remember Jesus, whenever he came preaching, he said he came preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We need to, each and every one of us, because we're sinners, we need to have a repentant heart. We need to come and be, be, have a desire to change our lives. And Isaiah had that, and so whenever he had that in his heart, God said, okay, we can use him now. He will go for us. And he let Isaiah overhear that. And Isaiah jumped up and he said, here am I. Send me. But you know what? As we read on, I'm sure glad that our ministry is more fruitful than Isaiah's would be. Because God had something to tell him about his ministry. I said, here am I, send me. He said, go and tell this people, the Israelites. 
Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. God does not paint a very rosy picture of the ministry that God gave him. Isaiah. He said, you're going to preach, but they're not going to listen. They're not going to want to understand. They're going to reject me. Now that, you know, well, what's the purpose here? I, you know, wouldn't you be thinking that? Wouldn't you be wondering that? Well, what is the purpose? Well, you know what? The purpose is God has always had a message and he's always had a messenger. And you know what? God has not given me the liberty of, that, he, that he gave Isaiah. He's not told him how, that his ministry would be unsuccessful as far as producing a lot of results. And I'm thankful I don't know that. I'm thankful I don't have that knowledge. But the ministry that Isaiah had was not in the large crowds that would be coming. The large offerings that would be brought into the coffers. You know, God doesn't need our offering. That's not the purpose of it. What God wants is our service. God wants us to never give up. Even whenever the circumstances look as though people just don't care. I remember reading, you know, being a student of history, I remember reading the speech that Winston Churchill gave over the radio to the people of Britain. If you're not familiar with World War II, before America entered the war, Germany had conquered all of Europe. They'd overrun all of Europe. And the armies of Hitler were on the shore of France and looking over the English Channel. Just 15 miles away was the island of Britain. And the British were thinking they're going to invade us at any time. What do we do? Winston Churchill got on the radio and he said, we will fight on the beaches. We will fight in the cities. We will fight in the countryside. And he goes on, we will fight here, we will fight there. And he goes on and he says this, never, 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 Never give up. You know what? God doesn't give up on us. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come. All should come unto the knowledge of the truth. God in his all-knowing and all-seeing told Isaiah, well, you're going to preach, but the majority is not going to listen. They're not going to understand. They're not going to repent. But you know what? God has always had a message. He's always had a messenger. And he's always wanting to deliver that message, even though he knows that most will reject it. But you know what? God has a plan. He always has a plan. Listen to this. Then I said, Isaiah said, For how long, O Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant. And this happened. Until the houses were left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged. Until the Lord has sent everyone far away. That was into captivity in Babylon. And the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, ten percent remain in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak, now I looked it up, and the terebinth is a tree that's related to the oak. 
And we are no, we know oak trees as being what? They're strong. That's a strong tree. That's a strong uh, species. But as the terebinth and oak leaves stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. purpose for the nation of Israel as far as God is concerned had always been one primary purpose and that is from the nation of Israel all nations of the world would be blessed and all nations of the world would be blessed by a Messiah who would come out of the nation of Israel and down the cross and pay for man's sin. If the nation of Israel were destroyed as Satan would, would want to do, if they no longer walk the face of the earth as Satan wanted to do, they would be like the Medes and the Persians. Have you met any Medes and Persians lately? No. They're gone. There are many people groups as they, you know, the politically correct designation is now there are many people groups that no longer exist, that once did, for whatever reason, they no longer around. But you know what? God always preserved the Jewish nation, even if it was just a very small minority. And that's what God is talking about here when he says, as the turbinth and oak leaves stumps, when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. God was preserving the nation of Israel for his purpose. Though they forsook him hundreds of years, they, they worshiped our God. And God dealt with them. Righteously he dealt with them. But he said to Isaiah, I want you to go and I want you to preach and I want you to, to proclaim the message that I give to you. And even though the majority of people do not listen, there will still be, as he says here, a holy, a stump in the land. You look over a few chapters, I thought I'd written it down, but I guess I did not. Over a few chapters, Isaiah makes a statement. That the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, will grow out of the stuff. This is what he's talking about. The Lord Jesus will come from the nation. Now what does that mean to us today? What does that mean to us? We are the church of God, the Bible says. We are the people of God. You look around here, you know, if you took all of the churches in and around Collinsville, Texas, and you added all of the people that are in church this morning together, it would be but a fraction of the people in this area. Sometimes it's awful discouraging. Is it not serving the Lord? People don't do what they should do. And we can tell them and tell them and we can proclaim the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. But you know what? People are not going to listen. Not the majority. God's people have always been in the minority. And it's hard for us not to become discouraged. But folks, what we remember is God has a message. He has a ministry for us. And you know, while we may look around and these radio and television evangelists may be getting them in, you know, by the hundreds of thousands and getting the big bucks because, you know, the Bible says in the last days there'll be preachers who come and tell people what they want to hear. And you know what? 
This isn't an easy message to preach. It's not an easy message for you to hear. But you know what? You don't hear this kind of message on the radio or TV much, do you? The thing is this, though, and the thing we must come to grips with is God has a message. And He does not need us to proclaim it. But He wants to use us to proclaim it. And he has given us the church as the church. And you are the church. This building is not the church. This leaky roof is not the church. You are the church. And he has given each and every one of us a ministry, a job to do. Okay, it's 11 o'clock. I've got to stop. But let me finish on this. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You may wonder. You may be wondering now, well, Brother Danny, what, what is my part? What is my part? I could never get up and, and play that guitar like John. I guarantee you I couldn't need it. And you know what? That is something God has given John to do. You know, I could I could never play the drum like Robert. But that is something God has given Robert the ability and the talent to do. You may think, well, Brother Danny, I couldn't get up and talk to people like you do. You know what? I couldn't either when I started. I didn't think I could. I was a little quiet guy in the corner of the room. But you know what? God took care of it. Don't ask me how. That is something he's given me to do. The point I'm making, folks, is as a church, each and every one of us has a part. And some of us think that part, our part is not as important as somebody else's part. That is not true. Listen to this. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So it is with the church we're talking about. <laughs> For we are all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now listen to this. Now the foot cannot say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not be, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, you would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed it's talking about the church here, the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. You catch that? If they were all one part, who would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts we think are less honorable we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together. You catch that? God has put the church together. It's God that's done it giving greater honor to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. See, God has a part for you to do in Circle J Cowboy. I don't 
believe that anybody in here today, even visitors, are here just because of an accident. God has a plan. It doesn't matter whether we are in on the plan or not. God has a plan. You're here for a reason. You're here for a purpose. It may not be in this church. It may be in some other church. You're busy. But you know what? God has a, has a part for you to play in His church and in His service. And just because things don't go the way we think that they should does not mean that God's purpose is defeated. God's purpose. Just as it was God's purpose for the nation of Israel, though they were an utter failure from the beginning to the end, being all that they could have been, with many rejecting God, even though they were an utter failure, God still brought His purpose through in Jesus Christ who was born a Jew. And He died on the cross for our sins so that all nations could be blessed through Him. So God has a purpose for you in Circle Jack Cowboy Church. And it may not be evident to you what that is, or it may not be evident to you, and you may seem to think sometimes we're just spinning our wheels. But you know what? God has His purpose. What I'm trying to say is this. All God is asking of us is our faithfulness, our trust in Him, and our service to Him. And the Bible teaches that God will give an increase. It may not be the kind of increase you think of, either. Let me give you an example. One I've used many times. Everybody's here heard of Billy Graham, haven't they? Everybody you mentioned Billy Graham's name, you know it. You know who exactly who I'm talking about. How many of you know the name of the fellow that led Billy Graham to the Lord? I've read his name. I can't remember it, though. He's not famous as far as humans are concerned. But I can't help but believe that whenever that fellow, and he's, I'm sure he's already in heaven, because Billy Graham is in his 90s, I'm sure that God is saying to that fellow, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, it may not be recorded here on earth what you do, but it's being recorded in heaven. Other people may not notice your service to God, but God. Let's serve God. Let's carry out His will. Let's be faithful to Him, even in the life of a person. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank You for this day. I thank You that You have given us this place to serve You. And Heavenly Father, even though we go through adversity, even though it looks as though we're not gaining ground, help us to realize that's not the reason we're here. And Heavenly Father, whenever we do gain ground and we are being successful as far as our ability to see and people are coming, Heavenly Father, to help us, help us not to slack off. And as the scripture says, let us not be weary and well-doing, but help us to be faithful. I ask it in Jesus' name. Thank you. All right, we're going to have, how long do y'all need?